We continue today the series uh, that we started in this new year called Half Truths, where we're looking at these phrases that we may have said a time or two, phrases that we've maybe had said to us a time or two, phrases that are kind of Christian cliches, and they have the ring of truth about them. We may even think they come straight out of the Bible, but what we've been doing is unpacking them, digging into them a little bit. And recognizing that at best these phrases are half true and at worst they're not true at all. And uh, honestly my goal is that we would eradicate these from our vocabularies. Just get rid of them. Because what ends up happening is that they become, I don't know, confusing, misleading. And I think that these phrases we're looking at actually push people away from God. Especially folks that are more curious about Christianity or curious about faith. They hear these things and it pushes them away from God. So... Let's scrub them out of our vocabularies. So far, here's what we've looked at. Everything happens for a reason. Scrub it out of your vocabulary. God helps those who help themselves. Get rid of it. God won't give you more than you can handle. Don't ever say it again. Um, they sound good until you dig a little bit deeper, scratch the surface off, and they simply are half true at best. So today I'm uh, drawing from uh, some of the, the writing of Adam Hamilton as we look at this next phrase, which is, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Now I've got to admit that um, this is one, you know, it may not be quite as popular as the other ones we've looked at, but it's really, really important that we get at this one. Um, I've seen it on bumper stickers, on cars, you know, driving, I see a bumper. I've seen it on billboards before in lots of different forms. And actually it is the motto of some churches that are out there and it gets said a lot. And when people say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. What they're really talking about is the Bible. They're, they're really talking about scripture, what we call our, our scriptures and what they want to believe about it. But I think it is just dangerous to oversimplify this book. I really do. So here's an example of what I mean. Uh, the Bible passage that, that we're about to look at is one that I would wager none of you have printed on a wall hanging that's hanging on your wall right now. I bet none of you have this scripture on a wall hanging. I have never used this next scripture as a centerpiece of any message that I have ever done. But in the 1880s, this next scripture was used a lot in the sermons that were preached in a lot of churches. All right, and, and uh, before we actually put the scripture on the screen, the, the, the nature of the scripture is that it was instructions for the Hebrew people as they wandered through the desert toward the promised land, okay? Let's take a look at it. Aren't you eager to see what this is? Here it is. Mark out an area outside the camp where you can go and relieve yourselves. <laughs> along, along with your weapons, have a stick with you. After you relieve yourselves, dig a hole with the stick and cover your excrement. Keep your camp holy. Do not permit anything indecent or offensive in God's eyes. The Bible is a very practical book, <laughs> right? The question you should be asking is, so why was this passage a central passage in the preaching of a lot of pastors in a lot of churches in the 1880s? And the answer is, in the 1880s, there was a new technology that churches were struggling and debating about. Indoor plumbing. And some people were like, oh my gosh, this would be awesome to not have to run out to the outhouse when it's cold. You know, we can have indoor plumbing. We have toilets in the church. And other people were like, are you kidding me? God has said he will turn away from their people, his people, if they relieve themselves inside the camp. And the church is the camp. Why can't you understand that God doesn't want to see the unholy things that come out of your body? So we need to keep outhouses out back where they should be, where the Bible says it. And I believe it. And that settles it. And that may sound kind of funny to us, but it was not funny to them in the 1880s. Now, over the next 75 years, this has really not been an issue for the church. And, and, and we look at this verse and we think, God is not offended by indoor plumbing. We've reinterpreted that scripture in its context today. Now, we look at other things in the Bible the same way. Like the Old Testament's pretty clear about not eating pork. No bacon, no baby back ribs. No, you can't even play football because you're not allowed to touch the skin of a pig. The Old Testament prohibits eating shrimp and wearing clothing of mixed fibers. Uh, uh, it prohibits men from trimming the edges of their beards. It, it says no to tattoos. 
When we say God said it, the Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it. I don't think many of us read the Bible that way. And I don't think we, we want to. We don't apply it that way. Another example, Exodus 21. It says, anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. Exodus says, if anyone works on the Sabbath, they're to be put to death. This is how the Bible was used in the 1800s by lots of Christians in the South when it came to the issue of slavery. People that were pro-slavery were like, hey, you know, there are 200 verses in the Bible that affirm slavery. Slavery is a part of the culture God created, the social order God created, and they used Scripture to prove it. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Some of the other parts of the Bible that we look at and we wonder about come from the Apostle Paul when he talks about women. Several passages in Scripture where he says things like this. This is 1 Timothy 2. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. And you need to know that Paul was not married when he wrote that passage. Because <laughs> if he had been, he wouldn't have wrote it. <laughs> And you also need to know that Paul's thoughts changed. We, can, we see that in his letters, right? His thoughts changed. And, and he had women in authority, acknowledged women in authority, in leadership. When we read, when we read Paul's words and, and, and they say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's why a lot of churches, to this day, they still say that women can't serve in leadership. Women cannot serve in a role where they teach Men, They can teach children, but they cannot teach men. They certainly can't stand up in church and read scripture. They can't become pastors. So from where we go to the bathroom to what we eat, the death penalty for disrespectful children, slavery, the clothing that we wear, who can speak in church? We got to recognize that saying God said it, I believe it, that settles it, is an oversimplification of our most sacred texts. Now, part of the challenge in this cliche is that it implies that what the Bible says and what God say are exactly the same. Now, in the Muslim faith, they say that God dictated the Quran to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel. And they believe that the Quran is literally the exact words of God. And some Christians believe the same thing about our Bible. But we need to know this. The Bible doesn't say that about itself. When you read, you see things like this. You see that the, the biblical authors, they had names. And yeah, God is working through them and, and in them. But human beings are writing these things in various times from their various perspectives. Some of the Old Testament writers even talk about drawing some of what they put in our Bible from other books, from the annals of the kings of Israel, the annals of the kings of, of Judah. That's part of what's in our Bible. They, they wrote down what they did because they believed it mattered. They wrote down what they did because they, 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 they believed that God was guiding them in the process, but not dictating word for word what they were putting in there. Now, when you get to the prophets in the Old Testament, you find the Bible saying things like, the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that God dictated every word they wrote, word for word? No. But that leads to a couple questions. Um, how did the word of the Lord come to the prophets? The word that they wrote down. And that leads to another question. How does the word of the Lord come to you and me? Here's what it looks like for me in my life. When I'm getting ready uh, for messages on Sunday, the things that, that I talk about up here, and what happens is it's a process. And it begins, you know, six months or a year ahead of time where, you know, a group of us sit down and we pray. We're just, we start with prayer. God, what do, you, what do you want us to do? How do you, where do you want us to go with the messages over the next six months or the next year? And, and we begin to just listen and, and, and kind of toss some things out. And then we get a little more formal about that. And then, you know... Uh, it comes to the time where I'm actually sitting down writing the words and I look back at what I've done in the past and I look at what other pastors have done and I, I read commentaries and I study and I read books and then I look for ways to illustrate what I'm teaching that will make it hit home and make it connect. And, and then I realize I'm very human and I can get it wrong and I do the best that I can. But sometimes, like last week, this happened last week, um, I was out in the lobby just talking to people, and somebody came by and said, Aaron, I just want you to know, it felt like you were talking to me directly today. And I got to tell you, that wasn't me. What is that? 
when God speaks through me or through a song or through somebody else, what is that? That's, that's the Holy Spirit at work. That's, that's you doing something like saying, okay, God, I'm, I'm listening. Help me to know. Help me to understand. Teach me. That, that's what that is. That's how the Lord speaks to us. That's how the word of the Lord comes to you and me. We just do the best we can. and We're human. Sometimes we mess it up. How did the word of the Lord come to the gospel writers? You know, our New Testament begins with the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are four people that just, what they're trying to do is, is, is write the story of Jesus. Some of them tell us about his birth, and, and all of them tell us about his life, and his teachings, and his death, and his resurrection. None of them say, hey, God said to me, dictate this, and I wrote it out word for word. Just look at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. It's probably my favorite gospel right now. The Gospel of Luke, where Luke says, um, I went and I interviewed all the eyewitnesses I could find, the eyewitnesses of Jesus' life. I, I, I went and I looked at all the things that had been written about Jesus up to this point, um, and I brought all that together. I synthesized that into a gospel so that you could know who Jesus is. What does that sound like to you? It kind of sounds like an investigative journalist or a historian bringing these things together. A big part of our New Testament are the epistles. That's just a fancy churchy word for the letters, you know, because a guy named Paul and, and other people, they wrote letters, and the letters were, you know, really matter of fact, most of them, uh, matter of fact about answering questions that people had about the faith or encouraging some people, a little group of new Christians on, in, in their faith journey or, or, or addressing some big issue. They're just letters that, that, that Paul wrote to help people. He never thought, Paul never thought that he was writing scripture. He thought he was just writing letters to help people in their faith. He never mentions God dictating anything to him. It sure doesn't seem like God dictated every single word of the Bible. So you can just offhandedly say, God said it, I believe it. That settles it. One scripture that's quoted when people say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, is 2 Timothy. And this is a writing of Paul in our New Testament. And it begins this way. All scripture is inspired by God. That sounds pretty weighty, doesn't it? And it is. But we've got to ask some questions like, what did Paul mean by scripture? Uh, he, he's obviously talking about the Old Testament. Why is he obviously talking about the Old Testament? Because the New Testament wasn't even written yet. So he's talking about the Old Testament. That leads to another question. Which part of the Old Testament? Because a large segment of the Jews believe that only the first five books of the Bible were sacred. Some believe that other parts were sacred too. But which part was Paul talking about when he says all scripture? Uh, we don't know because he didn't tell us. But we do know that he was not talking about the New Testament because it didn't exist yet. And then there's the word in there, inspired. All scripture is inspired by God. What, what does that word inspired mean? In the original Greek, it's the word theonoustos. And it's a beautiful word. It's a powerful word. It means God breathed. And what's really interesting about this is it's the only place that this word, this is the only place that's used in the whole Bible. It appears nowhere else in the Old or New Testament. In fact, this word is found nowhere else in all of Greek literature before Paul. What does that tell us? Paul made this word up. All right? Well, there's nothing wrong with that at all. It's a beautiful word, God breathed, but he didn't tell us what he meant by it. I mean, God breathed. He could mean that the scripture that he's thinking about have the essence of God in them. He could mean that, 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 that God helped the writers write what they did. He could mean that the biblical writers wrote these things that we have, and then God breathed on those words so that when we read them, we, we catch that essence, that breath of God within us. It could mean any of those things, all of those things, none of those things, something different. We just don't know because he didn't tell us. But let's look at what Paul went on to say. Take a look at this. All scripture is inspired by God, theonoustos, God breathed. And it's useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. That's Paul's point right there. 
The, the scriptures exist so that God can have a way to, to teach us, to guide our lives, to shape us so that we make better decisions. We become the kind of people that God wants us to become. But it's just not as simple as God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Oh, and even if God said it and I believe it, that still doesn't settle it. Because we have to do the hard work of interpreting it and applying it to our lives. And all we got to do is look at Jesus. Let's start with Jesus. I mean, he clearly did not have the idea that the Bible says that I believe it, that settles it. Because there are several times when Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. What's he doing when he says that? Well, he's, he's looking at the Old Testament saying, yeah, the Old Testament says this, but I'm telling you something different. You have heard it said, but I say to you. One of the things he addressed was divorce, and he, he, he goes right for Moses. He said, Moses taught you this about divorce, but that is not what God intended. I tell you this. Oh, wow. So Jesus is reinterpreting the scriptures. The apostles did it too. See, there were, there were things that were in the Old Testament that they had to reinterpret for a new context. When Christianity, you know, began to, to spread, like, like the first Christians were Jewish, right? Uh, all the first Christians were, were Jewish. But then as word spread and people saw the difference that Jesus made in the lives of folks, even non-Jews started to say, I want to follow Jesus. I believe I, I, I want to follow Jesus. And, and the Jewish Christians were like, that is great. Uh, but first, you got to become Jewish. And if you were male, that meant first, you got to be circumcised. Hmm. Now, what Paul knew is that being a 20 or 30 or 40 year old man who's chosen to follow Jesus and then being required to be circumcised, that might be a deal breaker to your faith. You want to do what to my what? What? <laughs> No, thank you. <laughs> so Paul reinterpreted the law and he said, I know what it says in the scriptures, but I don't think that circumcision is what shows that somebody is a faithful follower of God. And this was scandalous. I mean, it caused a rift in the early church because there were those who were like, no, that people got to become Jews first in order to become Christians. And others were like, no, if we lay all these laws on them, the Ten Commandments and 613 laws and a couple thousand rules, we can't even, as Jews, abide by those. How are we going to expect somebody that has no history to abide by those? Or we can't do it. So they had this, had to get together and have a conference. By the way, this is in Acts chapter 15, if you want to read about this. Acts chapter 15. They had a conference, and they discussed, and they debated, and then they decided. And it was one of the biggest decisions in, in the history of Christianity. And they decided all those rules and laws of Moses, other than a couple little ones, all those rules and laws of Moses did not need to be applied to Christians. Wow. Changed everything. God said it, but the apostles realized that didn't settle it. They were more like, well, God said it, yes, but we still have to wrestle with it in our time and in our current context. And that's why we don't have strict food laws. That's why we can eat bacon. Can I get an amen? <laughs> you know, the early leaders in Christianity were more like, hey, the Bible says it, therefore, we take it very seriously and we will look at the past in light of Jesus, who he was, and what he taught us. Now, here's the danger in what I've said. You all are probably already way ahead of me. The danger is this. Some Christians have taken this idea, and they're like, all right. Now, anything we don't like in the Bible, <laughs> we can just ignore it. Why would we do that? Because we're sinners, and we're always looking for a loophole, right? Always. We can say, that was for them, not for us today. And so we can like, the stuff we don't like, tithing, let's get rid of that, you know. <laughs> Love your enemies, ah, you know. Uh, turn the other cheek, mm. a lifestyle of nonviolence, uh, you know, we've got to be honest. Sometimes because of our nature of sin and looking for the loopholes, we want to water down the gospel for our convenience, that's why we need to interact with one another. We need to have these conversations. We need to process together. We need checks and balances so we don't water down the faith. But at the same time, there are parts of, of the Bible that if they're hurting people or they're keeping people from faith, we've got to ask questions and we've got to wrestle with that stuff. So the Bible is the words of people. 
holy words, but words of people. But John calls Jesus the Word of God. Capital W. Jesus is the Word. We looked at this in Advent because it's kind of an Advent sort of thing, right? And, and the word in Greek for word is logos. And logos in this context means the essence of, the mind of, the nature of. So when we look at Jesus, we put that all together like Jesus is the, the mind of, the nature of, the essence of God, of God in human form. If you want to know what God looks like, you look at Jesus, that is going to be your clearest picture of who God is and what God is like and how God loves. And for me, that means I'm going to read everything in the Bible in the light of Jesus. And if what I read doesn't line up with Jesus, I'm going to say, I choose Jesus. So I read in the, the Old Testament where it says that if a priest's daughter becomes a prostitute... She is to be bound and burned alive by her father. That's what it says. But then I read how Jesus was called a friend of sinners and a friend of prostitutes. And, and when a prostitute comes and, and falls at his feet and weeps, what does Jesus do? He forgives her and offers her mercy and grace and points her toward God. When I look at that text from the Old Testament in light of what Jesus did... I choose Jesus. There's an, in another place in the Old Testament, it says that God told the Israelite warriors to go kill 42,000 foreign women and their sons, little boys. They were enemies of God. And then I read where Jesus says this, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. When I have to decide between those two, I choose Jesus. The word, the word, capital W of God. And, and I don't exactly know what to do with those other texts in the Old Testament, but I, I do know what Jesus said about how to treat sinners and how to treat my enemies. And then Jesus really helps us interpret the Bible when he says this, all the law and the prophets can be summed up in two commands. Love God with all your heart soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. He said, all the law and the prophets. What are the law and the prophets? That's pretty much the whole Old Testament. It's all summed up in two things. Love God and love people. And there's a third thing in there too. If you notice the word yourself. Love yourself. Love God. Love people. And, and I like to put it this way. Jesus made it, made it simple. But he did not make it easy. Simple and easy are two different things. He was like, yeah, living this stuff out. Love God, love people. But we still have to do the hard, hard work of thinking and conversing and praying and listening and studying and wrestling with ideas, old ideas and new ideas. And more than anything, we got to look at Jesus. You just keep looking at Jesus. Keep looking at Jesus. What did he teach? How did he live? How did he confront people? How did he respond? And then when there's no clear teaching from Jesus on a particular thing, we look at the big principles of what he taught. And what are those big principles? Grace, mercy, self-sacrifice, putting the other first, nonviolence, turning the other cheek, truth, integrity. When we say God said it, I believe it, that settles it. We need to know that Usually, we're saying that because we want to attack someone else or we want to create division or we're trying to make it easy on ourselves because there's something in there that's too hard for us to really want to do. But I'm challenging us to recognize the Bible doesn't work that way. And thank God that it doesn't, right? And we have permission from the apostles, we have permission from the saints, we have permission from Jesus himself to wrestle with the Bible and to ask our questions and to search, search for answers. So, I got to tell you, I love this book. I read it every day. And, you know, the channel, I challenge you to read it every day, too. Five verses, that's, the, you know, minimum. Five verses, all of us reading five verses every day, listening for the voice of God. I have parts of this memorized. This book has shaped my life like nothing else. 
you know, the stories of our ancestors and, and the stories of Jesus, what he taught, how he lived. Man, the, my Jesus, the Jesus I've given my life to, the, the one I, I listen for, the one I, 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 I receive every day and welcome into my heart. Every, I mean, it's all in here. And I want you to have the same love and respect and engagement for this beautiful book and know that you have permission to wrestle and ask your questions. Don't settle for half-truths. Do not settle for cliche Christianity. Just do everything in our power to seek the whole truth. And for today, that's the good news. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.